Oh, you go. Okay. And uh, now we have uh, Mark Bickford talking about uh, cubicle type theory with several universes in New Pearl. Uh, go ahead. All right. So uh, I think my talk is going to seem simple minded compared to some of the talks we've had. But uh, anyway, this is what I know. So let me see. I'm going to click here. All right. So it seems amazing that it's more than four years ago that we started working on this. But anyway, with the uh, guidance from Terry Kokan and Anders, we uh, formalized a constructive model of cubicle type theory in New Pearl. And that model did not include the higher inductive types because they hadn't had it all worked out at the time. And I think they've worked it out since then. So with more work, I could put those in to this model. And I just want to mention that uh, New Pearl implements intuitionistic mathematics because we have bar induction and we have a continuity principle. And so using some of that, or just even without that, we can formalize a lot of constructive analysis in New Pearl. And I can, I've even proved the constructive version of Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So one question is, can I formally connect proofs in cubicle type theory with constructive analysis? I know there's been work on that topic. But uh, I'm going to give you some partial answers to, to, to some things like that today. So, he so here are my two main questions that I'm talking about. So at CMU, they're building a new version, a higher dimensional version of New Pearl, I guess you could call it that, uh, to make a proof assistant for cubicle type theory or hot or whatever. And so the first question is, could I somehow use my model of CTT in New Pearl to implement a proof assistant for CTT inside of New Pearl as it is? You know, could I make some kind of internal extension for CTT inside of New Pearl so that we wouldn't need a new version of New Pearl? At least I wouldn't need it. Um, and the second question is, you know, how, how do the sort of synthetic definitions and proofs inside of cubicle type theory relate to the analytic definitions and proofs that I would do in constructive analysis. So, in, you know, if we prove a theorem like pi n of Sn is isomorphic to the integers in CTT, do I get a proof of the same fact in constructive analysis? Now you might say, well, meta-theoretically we know that's true, but I don't, I'm not satisfied with a meta-theoretic proof. I want a, I want a real proof in New Pearl that has constructive content because the constructive content of that theorem would construct Brouwer's degree of a map. You know, given a, a, a function from the sphere to a sphere, it would actually tell me what the degree of the map was. So I want, I want a constructive uh, content for these things. So would that be possible? Those are my two questions. Can I do proofs in CTT inside of New Pearl using what I have? And can I relate them to constructive analysis? So, so a lot of this stuff that on my next couple of slides has already been covered in previous talks with sort of, you know, it's assumed everybody knew all this stuff. So I'll just quickly run through this. So in abstract Martin-Lock type theory, you know, it looks like that. You have these, these kind of rules and that kind of syntax where there are no variables there. They're just contexts, terms, substitutions, and so on. So the, it has equations that look like this. Substitutions are associative. There's composition of substitution. There's like a beta rule. There's, so anyway, so the primitive concepts have has been covered in previous talks. There's contexts, there's types in a context, and then some notion of equality on types. There's terms and some notion of equality on terms. And then there's these substitutions, which are these natural transformations and some notion of equality on those. So those are the primitive concepts. And notice this syntax is, doesn't have variables. So like normally you would expect in working in type theory to have contexts where you have variables X and Y bound to these uh, types and then your terms and your types would have those variables. But in this syntax, we just have this thing, gamma dot A dot B. And then instead of X and Y, you, you, we use these expressions P and Q so P is a substitution that goes from gamma dot A to gamma, and Q is a term of type A in the context gamma dot A. So, so these terms, Q, Q, P, Q, P, P, are like De Bruyne indices for the variables. So instead of having variables, we have these things. 
So those, that's very nice for defining the semantics. But for actually doing proofs, it's not very nice. You, you know, when you want to actually construct proofs, you know, you, you would prefer to have the variables. So now for that abstract syntax, we, we used, you know, the, the thing I formalized in New Pearl for cubicle type theory is based on this general concept of these free sheaf models, which se seems like everyone already knows this, so I'll zoom through this. So you can start with any category, and then, but then for the uh, cubicle type theory, we use this particular cube category where the objects are just finite sets of names, and we didn't need to use nominal logic. The names could just be natural numbers. And then an arrow in the category, I might have this arrow backwards, but anyway, it takes the, it's a function from one set of names to the free De Morgan algebra generated by the other names. So free De Morgan algebra is a bounded distributive lattice that has an involution that satisfies De Morgan's laws. Anyway, so in this setup, context is a pre-sheaf, which is a functor from the opposite of the category into the category of sets. So I'm going to talk more about what we should use for sets, but just think of it for now as types. So that boils down to saying that you have a family of sets, a family of types indexed by the objects of your category. And then you have a way of, you have a family of functions that maps between them. So you basically, it just boils down, you know, for me, it just boils down to a family of types and a family of functions on those types such that the diagrams commute. And now I've got an equal sign in there, so exactly what what that should be, you know, if it's if it's just types, then that's just the equality in my types, but it could be something else later. Okay, so that's what a context is. Then the elements of a pre-sheaf are just the pairs of an object in the category together with a member of that set, that type. So they form a category. And so then the types are pre-sheafs over those things. So again, that just boils down to now a family of types now indexed by an object of the category and a member of the context there and a family of functions such that the diagrams commute. Okay, so, and then the terms are then, I'm not sure what the category theory for this is. Is it a section or I'm not sure what it is, but anyway, it's a, it's a family again of, of things that take these things and it goes into, you know, anyway, such that the diagrams can be. Okay, and then the substitutions in this setup are the natural transformations between these contexts, which are functor, functors. So, so I think everyone already knows this, but anyway, um, so that's the setup. So, so here's the question, what should, what should I really use for set? So when I started this, you know, it, you know, in the meta theory, it was just sets, but, but they had to be constructive. So I have formalized in New Pearl constructive set theory a la Oxl, you know, you know, where the sets are big W type. So I could use that, but it seemed much more natural to just use the category of types in a, in a universe. So there the objects are just the types in a, in a particular universe and the arrows are just the functions. So that's what I did. You know, in, in the formalization, we just use that. And because New Pearl is an extensional type theory, you know, everything worked. So I did all the formalization using that choice for what uh, set should be. But another choice for set would be the category of setoids, where a setoid is now a pair of a type and an equivalence relation on that type. And so a setoid has two components, a type and an equivalence relation, which you write like that. And then the arrows are the setoid maps. So a setoid map is a function from the type of one to the type of the other, such that it preserves the equivalence relation. So that would have been another choice for set. And that, that really corresponds more to what Bishop called a set in his constructive analysis. And that's the way he, he had the real numbers. He said the real numbers are not just a type, you know, they're a type together with an equivalence relation and he says, you do not form the quotient type. You, you keep them separate. So anyway, I could have used that and more on this later. So anyway, in either case, 
a pre-sheaf has a, a universe level. I have to pick a universe level, you know, to, to, to pick my uh, objects up from. So, so the context was a pre-sheaf, so that has a level, and then the types were a pre-sheaf over the elements of that pre-sheaf. So that could have a separate level. There's no reason that those two uh, universes have to be the same one. And so that's a question. Could I assume that I've just got one universe that both the context and the types are coming from, or do I have to be more general? So more on that below. All right. So the so the first question is can you know is can I so you know, so then using this setup you know we made a model of all the all the other types in typical type theory I mean this with this setup there's a standard definition of the pi and sigma types and then for typical type theory we have to define the path types and the glue types and what they call the system type and you know a bunch of other types so we did all that and it was a lot of work it took me about maybe 18 months, maybe, altogether. But anyway, now I've got that. So now the question is, can I make now a definition of truth using that for the syntax with variables? So it, when I wrote the abstract for this talk, that was kind of like the main thing I was thinking of talking about. But in retrospect, I think it's kind of boring. So I'm going to not talk a lot about this, but I'll just give you the gist of it. Because the more interesting question is how to connect to constructive analysis, I think. So, so here's the, the, you know, if I can do it, and I, you know, I have started doing it, and it's, you know, it's working. But, you know, it's kind of an obvious thing. You make a data type for the syntax, so. And then, you know, then you have to go through the boring stuff of defining on that data type. You know, since it's a data type for a, a language with variables, you have to define free variables, alpha equality, all that stuff. So anyway, so now in that setup, a context is now going to be one of these semantic contexts together with a set of variables and an assignment from those variables to types in that context. And then we have to give a in big inductive definition of the meaning in a context of something in this syntactic data type. And I'm saying it's going to be a provisional meaning because not every term in this syntax even means anything. You know, some of them are well-formed and they mean something and some of them don't. So here's one slightly interesting part of this work is what do I mean by the, oh, what do I mean by provisional? So here's, here's a type in New Pearl that I call the provisional, the type of provisional, that type of things that provisionally have type M. So it's a pair of, a, of what we call in New Pearl a proposition, which just means a type. So it says it's a pair of something that says this thing is okay. And then in the intersection over the squash of that okay, we have M. So this basically says it's a pair of a proposition. And if the first, if that proposition is inhabited, then it's something of type M. But if it's not inhabited, then this type over here is just what we call the type top. Anything can go there. And then it's quotiented by a certain equivalence relation, which says, that uh, you know, two of these things are equivalent if their okays are if and only if, and then given that it's okay, that the two second components have to be equal in type M. Anyway, with that slightly strange looking definition, that forms a monad. And so then you can just kind of program with it. And so using that, I was able to uh, make this big inductive definition of the provisional meaning of these syntactic things. So there's, you know, there's two kinds of terms in there. Some represent types and some represent terms. And they're sort of mutually recursively, you know, inductive on each other. So the, the ones that represent types, the, the, the provisional meaning is going to be a, you know, semantic type in the context together with this complicated thing called the uniform composition operator for that type that shows that the type is a what's called a fibrant type. And then for the terms, the meaning is going to be a type together with a term in that type. And so, you know, I was able to make that. And so, so here's just something you might not be able to read too well, but this is just to show you what, you know, what, what, 
what the syntax has in it. So basically, you know, in the data type, there's some sort of arity information. So basically, there's really four, four sorts of things. There's things that represent terms. There's things that represent bound terms that have one binder. There's things that represent types, and then there's things that represent type families. And so anyway, so then here are the type operators we have. We have the glue type and the case type. Case type is a, a simple, simpler version of the system type from which I can define the system type. And then we've got the pi type. So the, the pi type has a type and a type family. Sigma has a type and a type family. Path has a type and then the two terms representing the two endpoints. This is the face type and this is the interval type. And then we have decode of a term and, inver and universe. And then, oh yeah, and I stuck any, I can put all the numeral types from a, from a given universe in as discrete types. So I can stick them in. And then here are all the terms we have, encode, path abstraction, path application, lambda apply, and so on. And then, and, uh, and over in here, it's not, you know, this language is not completely untyped because I've stuck enough type information in here so that I can work out, you know, what, it's, what, it, what, what type it's supposed to be in and what the meaning is. So anyway, yeah, so then I've stuck in all the, the numeral terms of a given type in as sort of constants. So anyway, that's what's in there. And so what can I do with this? So, so this is still work in progress, but basically I added in all the numeral types in a given universe I. So then, so those are just discrete types where all the paths are REFL. And I added three universe types into this syntax. So you can ask me later in the questions, why couldn't I add countably many universes? But anyway, I only added three. Long time ago, uh, De Bruyne, Bob Constable was talking to De Bruyne about how we had universes in Nupro, and De Bruyne said, you only need three universes. Think about it and you'll see that I'm right. So in practice, for most purposes, he does seem to be right. So three universes seems like, you know, enough for now. Anyway. So those universes, since I stuck in all the enumeral types at universe I here, then these universes are going to end up with levels I plus one, I plus two, and I plus three. And here's a problem that I ran into. For the meaning of universe one in any context, I need the composition operator for that universe, which was what we constructed in the model. And that thing is going to need to be a composition operator at the same well, level or maybe one higher. But the context itself could mention any of the types. It could mention all these other universes. So it's going to ha have a possibly higher level. So this is where I ran into a problem because uh, in my original work <clears throat> in Nupro, we, 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 we give the universe levels explicitly, but we don't, we don't make them constants like one and two and three. We just call them variables like i, j, and so on. But they're explicitly in the, in the formulas as sort of implicitly universally quantified levels. And so in a lemma, when you need a, a type, you just put, you know, you just put ui. And, and then since they're cumulative, if you need a, you know, if you want to have one level that has UI and another one that has UI plus one, then you know you just instantiate the lemma to the maximum and you're fine. But in this case, it, it wouldn't work. If I just had only one level parameter in all my lemmas, then, then you know if the context had I plus three and I needed level I, I couldn't instantiate the lemma with the maximum and get what I needed. So I had to go back and revise the entire theory to use two different level parameters, J for context and I for type, say. And so that was, you know, it took me like 18 months to develop the original theory, but then in sort of in replay, so the, so the, so the, the you know, the, the theory that I have currently has, what, 470 definitions and 1,686 lemmas about them, some of them with very, very long proofs. So, you know, going through and making a change like this, superficially, it should be easy, but, you know, in it took me about a month to like work through the whole thing and get it all working again. So anyway, once I've done that, now this definition of truth works. I get 
you know, I get a meaning, provisional meaning for all the things. So I can give a provisional meaning now for all the judgments. So in particular, you know, the meaning of a judgment like this in context X, T as type T, that, that gives me a proposition, okay, and then it gives me the, the meaning of the type and the term that's in that type. So that means if I can only prove that these OK propositions that come from my inductive definition are always decidable propositions, then I could extract from that a type checking algorithm. And, you know, I could just use this and I could, you know, so I could, so I could sort of make a Agnes style proof assistant that would, you know, have tactics. It would construct these terms, pass it into this thing, get the provisional meaning, get the OK proposition, decide whether it was true, and if it was, it would say, okay, it type checks, and then I've got the new Perl meaning of that, which actually has the constructive content of the proof, because these are now new Perl types and terms of new Perl types. So that's the idea. It's still work in progress, because I haven't proved that these OK propositions are decidable, and in fact, they won't always be, because I've stuck in all the new Perl terms and types, so a new Perl doesn't have decidable type checking. But if I just stuck with sort of pure, pure cubicle type theory where the only, maybe the only new Perl types I stuck in were like the natural numbers or something, then I could probably find a, a fragment that would have decidable type checking. But even if it's not decidable, as long as I can, you know, sort of automatically simplify this OK proposition down to something as much as possible, then I could leave myself something that still has to be proved. Anyway, it should be, a workable, you know, possibly a workable way for me to build a, a proof assistant for cubicle type theory inside of new Perl. But, you know, because all that is, you know, kind of, I mean, you can sort of see the idea of it and, you know, it's just kind of technical and it's sort of boring. So I want to move on to the more interesting thing, which is the second, the second question. How can I relate proofs in cubicle type theory to constructive analysis? So first of all, I need to talk about the relationship between how constructive analysis, I think I spelled it wrong, uh, and, uh, and how, how we use setoids there. So in Bishop's analysis, the real numbers are a setoid. There's an equivalence relation, which we write, you know, like that, on these real numbers. The real numbers themselves are the converging Cauchy sequences. They're not equivalence classes of those, they are those. And then you have a, a, an equivalence relation on those. And then the reason for that is because on the actual Cauchy sequences, you have this locator operation, which, you know, given one real number less than another one, then for any other real number, you can decide whether it's greater than the first one or less than the second one. And so that's a, an operation that takes a real number and it makes a discrete choice. It says it's either this way or this way. If you quotient, that now all functions on the, on the quotiented reals will need to be uh, continuous. And so you can't make a, a discrete distinction like that. So, you know, in like in Bishop's analysis, you, need, you have to be able to do that. So, so Bishop says, don't do that. Don't form the quotient. Just keep them, keep, you, you know, work with a setoid. But he doesn't call it setoid. He just, he calls it a set. That's what he says a set is. So anyway, so similarly, a metric space in constructive analysis, the way Bishop does it, it's really a pseudo metric space. You have a, a type with a metric going into the reals, but the two points at, at distance zero do not have to be the same point. You know, it's only an equivalence relation. So again, a metric space is a setoid. It's a space with a metric that forms, that gives you an equivalence relation. So Bishop distinguishes operations, which are just things like this, that map, you know, one type into another type from functions. So he, so he says a function has to be a setoid map. It has to respect the equivalence relations. So that's a confusing terminology for most of us because we're so used to saying function means member of a function type, which is what Bishop would call an operation. And of course, it's confusing from the point of view of classical math, because there a function is just a single value, you know, total relation, you know. So 
Anyway, you have to. Uh, hi, Mark. Sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah. can you wrap up in like okay. one minute? Okay, I'm down to one minute. Okay. Oh, bummer. Okay, so anyway, so basically, uh, what happens is you can make uh, the the unit interval constructively forms a De Morgan algebra. You can you can form the space. You can form the singular cubes in a metric space. Which are just all the functions from a you know j-dimensional cube into the metric space, and you can use the De Morgan structure of the unit interval to turn that into a pre-sheaf over this cube category. So the metric space become you know the space the family of singular cubes in the space becomes a type in cubical type theory in the in the model, and a point becomes a term, and it turns out that the path type is, comes out to be the same as a as a regular as a function a setoid function. And so it, it becomes uniformly continuous in, in New Pearl because it's, uh, we're in uh, intuitionistic math. So, so, a f so the function type now, I would like that to come out to be a continuous function, but it doesn't. It's only an operation. But if I would now revise the theory once again in order to use the setoid interpretation instead of the type in interpretation, then it will it will come out to be a continuous function, and I've already proved that. So I so yeah so now we're in setoid hell. Once you generalize one thing to a setoid, you have to generalize another thing to a setoid, and then another thing, and another thing, and another thing. So it turns out all the basic concepts become setoids, and so I've you know I've I've done all the basic Martin-Lauf type theory in this interpretation, the pi's and sigma types, and now it does turn out that the that the maps in the cubicle model between these metric spaces are the same as the continuous functions. And so now that I have to finish that. So I've done about a thousand of my lemmas and I still got a bunch left to go. It will, it's going to work. It's going to take me another month. Then I have to construct the uniform composition operator for these metric types. So to do that, you have to be able to glue paths together and that won't work in an arbitrary metric space, but it works in a space in metric spaces that have a certain completeness property, weakly complete enough. Then I have to add the higher inductive types into the model using the setoid interpretation. That might be even harder. Finish my interpretation of syntax. <laughs> then we really need to wrap up, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, so anyway, this is the last point. If I do all that, then I could take Guillaume's proof that pi four of S3 is isomorphic to Z2 and I will get the same theorem in, in, in constructive analysis from it. So there we go. Uh, okay, thank you. Let's all uh, clap silently. And I think unfortunately we yeah. might not have time for questions, but uh, I don't know, Mark, if you'll be around after the sure. next talk. I but, can. Yeah, okay. yes. um, if, anyway, if you are, then uh, I guess yeah. we can uh, have some questions after there. Okay. All right. The, the next speaker around. Do I have to stop sharing? Uh, yes, yeah, I suppose. So.